Okay, so we also need to talk about the American response to the Holocaust, or America and the Holocaust. Um, during the early 40s, news started coming back to America that there was such a thing as a Holocaust occurring in Germany um, and in German-controlled areas that involved the rounding up imprisonment and torturing and killing of Jews, gypsies, native Poles, um, and other peoples. And the American response was generally, what can we do to help? The American public wanted to help um, because there were innocent people that were being hurt and killed. Um, however, the American government was very slow and, in fact, very apprehensive to help. Um, we, as a government, pretty much stood in the way of allowing large amounts of Jewish refugees to come to America. Um, now, we did allow some, in very small numbers, of Jewish refugees to come to America, but uh, this was something that caused the American people to get angry at the government uh, because they were allowing, the government was anyway, allowing people to suffer that didn't need to. People that were trying to get away from Europe and find a safe haven here were just turned away. There were actually instances of Jewish refugees that um, were on boats that would come to the American shores. One example, a group of Jewish refugees came from Cuba where they were told to go away to America where they were told to go away, and, and basically they had to go back to Europe, where they were trying to leave to get away from the Nazis. Um, and things weren't a lot better with Britain's response to the Holocaust either. Basically, Britain stood in the way of allowing Jewish refugees to come in. Now, um, they actually let fewer refugees come into their country than we did. And the reasoning was that they were having a hard enough time taking care of their own citizens and they didn't feel like they could allow other citizens or other people to come in and take resources that should be devoted to their citizens. Um, and America tried to use this as well as an excuse. But this is something that caused some division in America because the people were angry at the government for letting the Jews suffer. Okay, now let's move on to the topic of the American people in wartime. So we're talking about the people that are back home while American soldiers are overseas fighting. So what's going on in America, really, aside from everyone being united for the most part in the war effort, um, wanting to support the soldiers, wanting to do what they can, um, there's also a lot of prosperity occurring. People in America that are staying behind, they're working in factories, um, they're doing whatever they can to support the war effort, uh, this really causes the economy to explode in a positive way. Um, for example, in 1939, so before we entered the war, two years before we entered the war, um, our budget, the federal budget, highest it's ever been in history, is $9 billion dollars. To put that in perspective, um, our budget is computed in the trillions. I believe this past year, $3.4 trillion was our budget. Uh, but anyway, back in 1939, $9 billion was the biggest federal budget to date. And by the end of the war, in 1945, our federal budget was $100 billion. So the budget had grown in six years to ten times what it was. And what it was in 1939 was the highest it had ever been. So the federal budget just jumps off the charts, but a lot of this comes from wartime spending. Um, we're trying to supply our allies with weapons. We're trying to supply ourselves with weapons, uh, our soldiers. Um, and a lot of that is just it's government spending. And we also have to take care of things like production, um, uniforms, food, lots of things that go into uh, the, the budget increase. Now, our gross national product, so it's every, it's the measure of what we produce as a country. Um, in 1931, or I'm sorry, 1939, it was 91 billion. Um, by the time we see the end of the war, uh, so 1945, it's 166 billion. So 
our production as a nation uh, grows not quite at the same level, but grows at a significant level in relation to the federal budget. Uh, now, a lot of people in America, they like the prosperity, but they complained somewhat because the prosperity um, wasn't spread equally across the country. Uh, a lot of people on the West Coast, particularly California, saw a lot of economic advancement um, and a lot of investment from the federal government. And this is because a, a lot of the naval war was in the Pacific. Well, California is on the Pacific. So if you're going to build ships that need to go to the Pacific, it makes sense to build them in a state that's already there. Um, so a lot of the naval production was centered in California. And if you think at this time, um, we have 48 states. And California, one of 48, received 10% of all federal money invested in all the states. So a lot of Americans thought that this was unfair. Um, however, it also caused a lot of people to try to relocate out west to get jobs that were available um, in the production of ships. Now, all of these jobs that are available brings up a problem. Um, the issue of unionization. So, organized labor. Unions grew, the membership in unions grew significantly. Um, I'm not going to say that it doubled, it didn't even um, jump by 50%, but it grew significantly. Um, but the unions really had to take a back seat during this time period. One, one of the union's big weapons was striking. However, when the fate of a country is on the line, it's not really fair to strike to get a little bit higher wages or to get better benefits from your employer. Um, so the unions agreed to not strike, but they wanted concessions from the government in, in return. Um, so the government basically said, okay, in return, we will start hiring union laborers in our production factories. Uh, we'll try to, to make union membership available to everyone that works in our factories. Um, however, this didn't quite work out because while the organized unions didn't strike, um, there were things called wildcat strikes, which is basically the, the laborers themselves organize their own strike and just walk out. Um, and there were, you would think that if everyone's unified, uh, which most of the people were, that work would go on smoothly, everybody would just want to do its best for the country. However, there were times when labor stopped. In fact, um, there were 15,000 labor stoppages during the course of the war when we were involved. Um, and most of them were wildcat strikes where the laborers just walked off. Um, to try to prevent strikes, though, um, FDR, um, well, he actually he stood in the way of this, which is kind of surprising because he's trying to push um, his agenda here, and he's, he's all for government intervention. But um, there was a bill passed, which it was the smith Connolly Act. And this bill basically made you have a 30-day waiting period as a union before you could go on strike. So uh, uh, FDR actually vetoed this bill, but Congress passed it over his veto. So they passed it with a supermajority because they thought it was so important. Um, and this really brings into question the idea of stabilizing the economy and the labor, the workforce, while the war is going on. Um, one of the big problems that the government had and FDR had was, as the economy is booming, inflation is uncontrolled. Um, so one thing that FDR tried to do, and a lot of people did not like this, um, he tried to institute, and successfully did institute, by the way, um, the Office of Price Administration. So he had price controls on a lot of production. Um, and most Americans did not like this at all. They thought it was socialistic because it was. Uh, but FDR argued that it was socialism in the name of the country. It was for the good of the country, and people should just accept it. Um, and also, there was rationing going on to try to make sure our soldiers got what they needed overseas um, because they should have the first pick of production. So you see things like coffee, sugar, meat, butter, rubber for tires, shoes, canned goods, gasoline, fuel, oil, um, diesel, things like that, 
are going to the soldiers first, so that means that then there's rationing for the citizens. And Americans, again, they were willing to sacrifice for the, the war effort, but they also weren't, a very, uh, they weren't very big fans of rationing. And you actually start to see somewhat of a, a black market appear where people will get their rationed goods and sell them to someone else who already had their share of their ration. Um, but anyway, um, the government is spending tons and tons and tons of money to support the war effort. So economic expansion is just going through the roof. Production is going through the roof. Um, and the citizens are saying, we want access to these things um, that you're producing that are being rationed. Now, they're being... They're not being very vocal because they don't want to hurt the war effort, um, but they want the economy to be stabilized enough so that uh, enough things are produced that everyone gets their fair share, and that prices are stabilized too, which is what the whole point of the Office of Price Administration was for, but the people didn't want it done that way. Um, another thing that FDR did was he instituted the War Production Board. And this was supposed to be this giant super agency that would oversee um, all the contracts, all the production, all the purchases done uh, for the war effort. And it was supposed to have a lot of powers. It was supposed to have a broad spectrum of powers. But in reality, it, it really wasn't all that effective. Uh, people in the Navy, uh, people in the Army would just bypass the War Production Board and put their orders in anyway. Um, so this was another control that FDR was supposed to have instituted, but it didn't really do its job. Okay, now moving on from economic issues and the growth of American production, I want to talk about wartime science and technology. Um, now, when you think of wartime science, the first thing you may think of is the Manhattan Project um, when related to World War II. However, uh, wartime science was well underway in World War II long before the Manhattan Project ever started. Um, in 1940, the government started the National Defense Research Committee. And the goal of the National Defense Research Committee was to develop useful war technology. Uh, and the government spent more money on research for wartime uh, technologies in four years, then it had, it actually spent four times more in four years than it had in the past 40 years on scientific research. Uh, so the government was very interested in developing new war technologies. Now, initially, Germany and Japan had the advantage as far as war technologies were concerned. Uh, their submarines were far superior to anything that we had. Uh, their tank warfare, their armor, all of that was uh, largely... Uh, more successful than anything we had. However, we had some technological advances as far as production was concerned, um, as far as automation, assembly lines, things that were used to make automobiles were now used to make weapons or airplanes um, or armor or bullets. Um, the GM factory, for example, started pumping out um, guns for the French resistance, um, very simple guns. Uh, they, they made them, uh, I think they made seven a minute on their production line, which is it far outstripped any German production. Um, however, by late 1942 or early 1943, we were catching up technologically. Uh, we were becoming as advanced as the enemy was. Um, our radar and sonar were developing very quickly, and it allowed us to have an advantage over uh, the Germans with their submarine warfare. We were now able, with um, our, our radar technology that was developed, we were able to spot their ships, um, their submarines. We could even actually sometimes spot a periscope from three quarters of a mile away with our new radar, which was, the, was, was impossible with the radar previously. Um, we were developing better planes, bombers that could go long range, could carry thousands of pounds of bombs. Um, and we also had targeting technology that allowed us to drop our bombs with at least twice the precision as they were dropped before. Um, we also used early computers to try to decode. I, I don't know if you know what the Enigma machine was, but it was a German code machine. And we used computers to try to decode um, this. But the Japanese had something similar, which most people have never heard of before. It's called purple, like the color. 
only it was a very, very advanced code machine. Um, and we used our computer technology that was developed um, through our military research budget to crack the Enigma code and the Purple code, uh, which gave us great advantages when we were trying to combat the Germans because they, they thought their plans were secret because no one could crack the Enigma machine. Well, no one did, but our computer technology allowed us to do that. Um, so technology played a major role in allowing us to advance in the military campaigns and to successfully advance.